Well, we're very fortunate today to have as our annual distinguished lecturer, Professor Philip Sharp from MIT. Uh, Phil, uh, originally from Kentucky, uh, got his undergraduate degree at Union College. You might remember last year we had George Whitesides, who also turns out to be from Kentucky. So Kentucky actually must produce a lot of very bright people that go someplace else. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to do his uh, PhD in chemistry at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, then a postdoc at Caltech, and then I think the next step was maybe Cold Spring Harbor, and then about 34 years ago, we joined MIT on the faculty there. As a relatively young academic, he actually uh, made some important advances, uh, particularly in the area of RNA splicing. For that, he received the Nobel Prize in 1993. Uh, he's certainly a major leader in the whole world of biology. Uh, this morning, we had a small group together for him to talk about a report that he was co-chair of the group, which will be out soon. Uh, there's a pre-publication copy out, but there'll be uh, the regular publication out, which is called New Biology for the 21st Century. Those of you interested in biology will want to take a look at this report because this group really envisions biology in a different way than we envisioned it back in the last century. So, Phil, of course, has many honors to his credit. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a member of the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, other awards. But again, he received the Nobel Prize in 1993. Co-founder of Biogen, has been involved in other startup companies. He has a broad view of the world, but he also has a special love, I think, for RNAs. So, Phil, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Georgia Tech to be this year's distinguished lecturer. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Bob. It's a uh, real pleasure to have a chance to visit Georgia Tech. Uh, I've not been on your campus before, and the same the, how impressive your uh, activities are in, how impressive your activities are in bioengineering, biomedical engineering, and bioscience here. It's just uh, incredibly impressive, and coming from a fellow technology institute at MIT and having been trained for a couple of years at Caltech, uh, you're one of the brothers that we look at across the country and say, here's another institution that's making great contributions to the country in science and technology. What I'm going to talk about today is the biology of small RNAs, and I'm going to talk about the therapeutic promise briefly. And the reason uh, I'm combining those two, and for the uh, students in the audience and others, uh, I want to point out how new this science is. The science itself is only about 10 years old as a subject. It has really changed how we view biological systems in very important ways. And it has already begun to be translated into practical applications in therapeutic science. So the, the major view of this talk is Science in life science is a rapidly advancing field, and it's a small step from a laboratory into uh, practical applications, in this case, in the area of medicine. Now, if you think back in terms of biological systems, we viewed RNA initially after the discovery of DNA as the intermediate in the transfer of information between DNA to the protein. And this was viewed as messenger RNA and carrying the direct information from the gene. tRNA is the intermediate between the nucleic acid code and the amino acid code. And the link then is Crick recognized and others. And the ribosomal RNA as a component that was involved in decoding. And now we know the ribosomal RNA is a catalytic machine that is involved in the catalysis of linking the amino acids. And we look at this and say, the early world is a, an RNA world, where the RNA was the genome, the RNA was the catalyst, 
and the RNA uh, was involved in coding for subsequent coding for uh, functional protein. This changed quite a bit in the 70s when we realized that this concept of a gene had to be modified. And the concept of a gene had to be modified because the cellular environment could modify the nature of the mRNA in the transfer of information from DNA to protein. And that meant that through all the environment of the cell, signals in the cell, cell state, a gene became an ambiguous term. And a gene was only definable in the context of time and place of the cell. Because of processes such as alternative splicing, alternative polyvinylation, and RNA editing. So when someone talks about there being 25,000 genes in the human genome, we know that that's just a cocktail conversation. Uh, really, when we look at the nature of a gene, we know that genes are composed of exons. Exons in different Cells could be uh, included, as illustrated here, or excluded. Uh, different combinations of exons can be added at the phi prime end due to transcriptional initiation sites variation. And the three prime end variation uh, can be quite significant. And I'll come back and mention one aspect of that in the context of small RNAs later. But when we talk about 25,000 genes, there are single genes in your body that are expressed in more than 25,000 different proteins. So we see a complexity here that really is something we're still trying to master in terms of understanding how information is transferred from the DNA into the cell. But all of that in terms of RNA took on a different perspective. In 1998, when Andy Farr and Craig Mello discovered this process of RNA interference, where they recognized that double-strand RNA was a substance that, when introduced into cells, could generate an intracellular component that would silence a gene either at post-transcriptional processes by directing cleavage of the RNA, related processes at microRNAs we now understand in terms of silencing gene at a translational level, and related processes, which I won't talk about, we really don't know much about it in the mammalian cells, of silencing genes at transcription level. RNA took on the role of being a regulatory molecule. And to you in the audience as students, this is only 11 years ago. We didn't understand this process was there. Now, I didn't make this discovery, but for students in the audience, you have to realize that if you get trained by a senior faculty member, the senior faculty member owns everything you do. <laughs> so Andy Fire, who was a Fire and Mello, was a graduate student in my lab. He came to MIT as a 19-year-old math major out of Berkeley and did molecular and cell biology in my laboratory, got his PhD, and went off to Cambridge, England, and then to fame. So even though it's 25 years, I know it was my teaching that did it. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we know about, well, I'm sorry. This is a brief summary of the way we view this RNA process for RNA interference. Double-strand RNA is the uh, chemical structure that is recognized in this RNA interference process. Dicer is an activity, clips this into SI RNAs, small interfering RNAs whose structure is 21 nucleotides, du duplex structure. Enters a risk complex in which one strand is taken, the other strand is destroyed. That then pairs with messenger RNA, and if this complementarity is exact, that messenger RNA is cleaved, and that silences the gene from which this double-strand RNA sequence was made. And in worms and plants, what happens is, is this is a much more elaborate process. RNA-dependent RNA polymerase takes a small RNA, expands uh, the double-strand RNA nature, it is processed by dicer. As it expands, it becomes a much more uh, amplification and effective process, and it controls viral infections, it controls developmental processes, it controls gene silencing, and in fact, plant biology is very deeply involved in all these processes in RNAi. RNA plays a much bigger role in plant biology than it does in the mammalian biology. But the fact that this siRNA as the intermediate structure could be used then 
to actually target the silencing of a gene raised the issue of could we use RNA to be a therapeutic compound. Once we realized that every cell in the body has a machinery, as illustrated here, to take that double-strand RNA and silence a gene, and the reason it's there is microRNA, then the question is, could this be a new type of therapeutic where you could design a small RNA to any gene you want, introduce it into a cell, and silence a gene? And if you think about drugs, drugs are all gene-specific. Small molecules target specific proteins from a single gene. Antibodies target proteins from a single gene. In this case, it would be RNA. The only real challenge is how to get this RNA into a cell. And that involves, you know, the engagement of engineers and others, formulation and, and other things to turn this discovery into a practical application for the introduction of siRNA to silence genes in a therapeutic context. Now, this was a discovery in 98. This process started in the early 2000s. And the data I'm going to show you in the next few slides is from a company called Alnylam, which I am a co-founder of. I have every conflict of interest you can imagine. <laughs> and I'm not suggesting you buy any stock. I don't really care. <laughs> I'm just trying to use it to illustrate some science, but I will make sure you know I'm associated with it. In the broadest context, what this represents is the ability to introduce macromolecules that otherwise would not cross the membrane of a cell into the interior of a cell. In this case, we're delivering small RNAs, but you could even replace that small RNA with proteins or anything else. How to open the interior of a cell to the pharmacological scientific advances that we have now. So, one of the ways, and it's not the only way to do it, but I believe it will be most effective, is to take lipid particles that have PEG and other things to control what binds to them, introduce them into the bloodstream, and see them taken up, even targeted, to specific cells. And once targeted to the cell, enter the cell, release the RNA into the cytoplasm, and silence the gene. So what you're doing here is taking a little bit of solution from a test tube and moving it in the body into a cell in an organ. And that's a real interesting challenge. I won't show you that all the bits and pieces are very important. I just want to show you two examples of which uh, this uh, is. This is the question of can we silence two distinct genes in the liver of a mouse. This is Anilum's work presented in 2007. In this case, it's ApoB or factor 7, both genes that are expressed in liver. And what you see here is that you take siRNA and add it to the bloodstream at 3 mg per kg to 5. You see silencing of the, ex the expression of the RNA, this is RNA, in the liver. And therefore, 90% or at least 90% of all the cells in the liver are taking up the RNA and silencing the gene internally. If you do the same thing for ApoB, you see the same activity. And if you do the same thing for both of them, you see you can silence both genes simultaneously. So this shows you specificity, and this shows you you can actually pharmacologically silence two genes in the same liver tissue in an animal. This is in, delivered systemically in a mouse. Now, as they've said, if you're a mouse, we've got great news for you. If you're a human, there's going to be some more work to have to be done. So uh, this is a, a step forward in terms of this delivery issue. Can you reproducibly silence? Can it be possibly a pharmacological uh, approach? This shows three treatments with uh, siRNA factor 7, again silencing from systemic delivery into the liver, into the bloodstream of a mouse. You see recovery over uh, 30 days. Silence again, silence again. Half-life of this effect is about 15 days. So once you deliver the siRNA into these cells, it has a half-life of about 15 days, and you can do repeated dose. So there's a long way to go. But this is making progress in terms of how to approach the issue of taking the sciences of small RNAs and actually being involved in therapeutic activity. This shows a, a mouse model in which we are, in which a nylum is uh, targeting two genes in the liver of an animal. One is a gene in, 
important for uh, mitotic division. The other is angiogenesis. This is an orthotopic tumor model where the, a human uh, uh, cancer cell is being delivered to the animals 18 days later. These are uh, nude mice. You deliver the siRNA and you see two experiments in which you get prolongation of the tumor case. And this formulation is in human trials. But, you know, why does this work in, in, in human cells? And when I talk about RNA being a regulatory molecule, how extensive is it as a regulatory molecule in our cells? And that actually didn't become clear until 2001, when Victor Ambrose, Bartel, and Tushel published three papers in science where they actually did an experiment that should have been done 10 years before. And that is just take small RNAs from mammalian cells, clone them, and sequence them. And when they did that, they discovered that what Victor Ambrose and Gary Rovkin described in 93, where there was one gene being controlled by a small RNA called LIN4, was actually a much more extensive family. And I'll talk about the evidence that says over half our genes are being regulated by this microRNA process where well, there's new genes expressed in our present in our genome that's controlling the expression of a large number of genes in our tissues. Ambrose and Rovkin described this in 93 for one gene in C. elegans, but it wasn't until 2001 we recognized how extensive the pathway is. So as I mentioned, we know now that there's between 500 to 1,000 different genes that encode microRNAs in our genome. They are transcribed into a precursor RNA that has a hairpin structure. It's processed by drosha in the nucleus to make a hairpin, transported to cytoplasm, processed by dicer to make an siRNA type structure. That enters a complex called argonaut, and I want you to remember that because we're going to talk about that in a moment. And that complex then pairs the RNA to the message, and if there's partial complementarity of a particular type, it'll silence a translation and decrease the half-life of that message, and if it's exactly complementary, you get cleavage. This is why siRNAs work in our cells, because this pathway is there, and there's something on the order of about 50,000 to 100,000 microRNAs in every one of your cells. Translational processes here, we'll talk about in a moment, but this is the pathway of microRNA regulation in our cells. Now, what's the specificity for microRNA regulation? What's the specificity for targeting and regulating a gene? And that was actually understood by Ambrose and Rufkin in their initial paper, here showing a LIN4 microRNA from C. elegans, a worm, and LIN14, and this sequence between position 2 and 8. If there's complementarity here, it's called the seed region, and if that's paired, then that will suppress in part the translation of this messenger RNA and can destabilize it. So the specificity here is eight nucleotides, not the 21 nucleotides. And in fact, this portion of the sequence contributes very little. It is this portion here that seems to be the limiting aspect of microRNA. Now this was in 93, shown by biological experiment in cell culture, and then last year, Dimshaw Patel and Tom Tushel collaborated in the structure of the Argonaut protein in targeting microRNAs to message, and I just want to basically summarize that uh, in the following. Here's our Argonaut 2, and you see we got a code here of uh, what is called the middle part of the protein, the peewee domain of the protein, and the POS domain. And they are common between a bacterial-related Argonaut and, a home, uh, and the human. This probably targets some DNA activity. We don't understand that. But he did the crystal structure of these three components in this thermophilus ar uh, argonaut. And what I'll briefly mention is the interesting aspect is this seed region between 2 and 8 is lying in the protein held by the peewee domain in the structure of an A-form helix conformation so it can pair exactly to the message as the original seed sequence hypothesis was uh, exemplified. The five prime end of the uh, microRNA is held by the mid domain. The three prime end is held by the post domain. 
So the two ends of the microRNA are contained in this complex, and RNA degradation typically occurs in, in cells from the two ends. So it stabilizes the small RNA, and that's why you have half-lives of on the order of 15 or more days. So this is a structure that's consistent with the biology. Here's the atomic structure. I won't point it out, but this is the guide strand of the microRNA laying in the A-form helix held within the protein, and the seed region pairs. The catalytic activity or cleavage is over there, but that actually only happens when there's exact complementarity. So if we take the hypothesis suggested by our experiments in vitro and our atomic structure and say, well, what fraction of all messenger RNAs are actually being controlled by microRNAs? Uh, the best estimate comes from the work of uh, Chris Burge, Lewis, and Bartel at MIT, where they took the three prime UTRs of, of human uh, messenger RNAs, asked, is there conserved sequences across deep evolutionary time, back to chicken, and find seed sequences, sequences complementary to the microRNA seed sequence in these three prime UTRs, as illustrated here for microRNA 23. And these target sequences for the, those found in microRNAs are there at about three to four times more frequent than you can expect from any randomization process in uh, comparing statistically those sequences. So we have very direct evidence that microRNAs are pairing with 3' UTRs and that that is evolutionary conserved and therefore functional. And what does that bring us to in terms of an understanding of what microRNAs are doing in our cells? If we re uh, uh, restrict ourselves to considering 87 evolutionarily conserved seed families, just conserved across its evolutionary time, and we look for the distribution of preferentially conserved target sites, what's it tell us about messenger RNAs and their targets for microRNA regulation? And it suggests that about half of our genes have no target sites for three prime UTRs for this evolutionarily conserved set. So we think that by and large, about half our genes are not engaged extensively in this regulation process. But another half, have more than one target site. In fact, on average, there are four microRNA target sites in a typical 3' UTR. Not for one, but a mosaic of many different microRNAs targeting these uh, 3' UTRs. And on average, each microRNA seed family is controlling or interacting with 50 target messenger RNAs, 500 target messenger RNAs. So what does this give us as a concept for regulation by these small RNAs? There's 100 or so conserved small RNAs. They're engaged each with 500 different messages in a, a combinatorial mosaic, and that's giving us regulation that is important in the physiology of the animal because it's evolutionarily conserved. So that's a whole new concept of how regulation occurs in tissue, and what does it mean? How are we beginning to view the impact of these microRNAs. Well, early on it was recognized that microRNAs changed in the process of the development of cancer. This is a, an example of some of those experience, uh, experiments. This diagram came from Hannon and Weinberg in 2000, illustrating in red here uh, genes that encode protein, when mutated, we know can drive cancer. They're organized in pathways. This is the RAS pathway here. This is the MYC pathway uh, there and otherwise. And they affect you know, changes in gene expression, cell proliferation, DNA damage, apoptosis, and signaling. And now we know that involved, embedded in those signaling pathways are microRNAs that control RAS here with LAT7, uh, microRNAs that control cell death down here, microRNAs that show P10 regulation and expression, and this mosaic of microRNAs interacting with the cancer uh, oncogenes and regulatory processes is essential in the process of the progression of cancer. And to prove that, in, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, there were 150 patients that had uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, the uh, expression of small RNAs in those patient materials were analyzed uh, for the level of this LET7 
activity of a microRNA that targets RAS, when RAS is a regulatory activity signal for proliferation, and they were clustered on the basis of LET7 expression. This green means low, the red means high, and so this 150 patients were uh, clustered on the basis of LET7 levels, and you look at prognosis here, if you have low LET7, uh, your chances of surviving 50% in uh, uh, 80 months after surgery is significantly less than if you have high LET7. So obviously LET7 is an indicator of the changes that occur in cells that is driving proliferation and controlling the, the metastatic potential of these cells. Now there's a lot more specific information in GAID available about the role of microRNAs in cancer, but I don't want to go through that. I want to turn to then the question of how we view the regulation by microRNAs in uh, this process of cells. And I want to argue over the rest of my time uh, about this uh, issue that microRNA regulation, I believe, is best viewed as being involved in the robust, uh, robustness of cellular control. Now, what do I mean by that? It's clearly highly important in stabilizing the quiescent and non-dividing state. And we've shown that in terms of LET7 controls RAS and other proliferative activities. And as LET7 increases, the quiescent state of the cell becomes greater. Cell division is suppressed. It's also involved in the control of the differentiated state. And there were several papers early on, Lee Lim here in 05 and Stanley Cohen in Drosophila, that showed that as in a particular cell type, a microRNA is increasingly expressed, as cells become more terminally differentiated, that microRNA had a specificity in its targets to suppress genes that were expressed in other cell types. So as the microRNA became higher expressed in a differentiated cell, some set, set of them suppressed genes that are expressed in other cells, driving the cell deeper into differentiation. And then there is microRNA control of cell type specific genes. It's part of a regulatory process where certain sets of genes are set aside to be activated and silenced by signaling pathways. And part of this is actually the control of cells to uh, their changes in environment. And I'll talk about this in a moment, but we know that these signaling pathways of NF-kappa B and P53 are involved in activating microRNAs that are involved in immune response and control of cells to immune stimulation and other signaling pathways. And we also know that microRNAs stabilize cells against transient stress. They're very important in stress, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, in the, the final moments. But let's look at this in the context of robustness. What is the indication that it's robustness? It's not the same thing as transcription factors and other things that control cells in terms of their activities and cell states. Well, one, and I'm going to build on this in the next few moments, but one thing that actually uh, indicated this is something that we uh, published last year in which we uh, identified that the structure of messenger RNAs actually change in the context of the 3' UTR regions as cells become more proliferative, and therefore they escape from microRNA control as I will, or some microRNA control as I will illustrate in the next slide. So as cells begin to proliferate, the 3' UTR structures change, and some of them change, and the microRNA regulation is decreased in extent. That's been also observed by uh, David Bartel and by uh, another paper in the last year as well. So it's pretty general. It's still being debated specifically what's going on, but everybody agrees that cells go into mitotonic stimulation. Uh, they decrease their uh, 3' UTR structure as proliferative signals impact on cells, and this would be true in cancer cells. It looks as if the gene structure, as illustrated here, and we saw this earlier, where there's alternative polyadenylation sites producing the target sequences for microRNA regulation, that as cells proliferate, begin proliferative, they produce messenger RNAs with shorter 3' UTR targets, and therefore would not have targeted regulation for the more extended regions. So microRNAs are RNA binding proteins that affect post-transcriptional regulation would be less in effect as cells begin to divide. 
So what this suggests, and I won't go through the data, it's published, is that if we look at tissues from quiescent tissues and fully developed uh, organs to proliferative tissues and development to tumor tissues to cells and culture, we see a trend, not for all messages, for many, that the three prime UTR structure where regulation is mediated by microRNA and RNA binding structure is decreasing. So post-transcriptional regulation in quiescent tissue, such as the brain and many organs, is going to be more extensive than it is in tumor tissue and cells and culture. Some suggest it's proliferation less controlled by microRNA. I want to remind you that in 1985, 95, 2005, sorry, it wasn't Ogre, 2005, Greg Hammond isolated an embryonic stem cell, mouse embryonic stem cell, in which Dicer had been deleted. So this cell line grows. We have isolated many of these cell lines. It grows fairly rapidly, and it has no microRNA. So microRNA is not essential for cell viability. If I delete Pol2 as a transcription unit, there's no cell. It's essential. But all microRNA regulation is not essential. We just isolated a tumor cell. This is a sarcoma tumor cell line that Tyler Jacks and Manu Kumar at MIT were studying. This was in a uh, mouse model in which KRAS has been activated, P53 minus. Dicer is floxed, so it could be deleted. And we took these cell lines, uh, induced Cre, plated the cells, cloned out cells, and nine out of 10 cell lines we cloned out were deleted in Dicer. Dicer isn't required for a tumor to grow. Take these cloned cell lines, this is two of them, put them in a mouse subcutaneous model, and ask can this sarcoma form a subq the dicer plus microRNA plus cell creates a tumor in about 30 days. These two microRNA minus dicer deletions create tumors in about 40 to 60 days. So microRNAs are not required to form tumors. You can produce a tumor in an animal without microRNA. Interesting. Well, is that general? So we took uh, a mesenchymal stem cell system in which you isolate stem cells from bone marrow, uh, infect them with SB40T antigen, which is a, a oncogene tumor suppressor gene all in one, cloned out cell lines, had no uh, Cree deleted them, uh, and got Dicer minus clones grow a little slower. They double every 18 hours. These double every 14 hours. And then when we Put those, here's the flux. I won't show you the data saying there's no microRNA, but there's no microRNA in either of these tumor cell lines by biological and physical assays. And what you see here, that even these cell lines will increasingly differentiate. They're all osteoblast. You put them in differentiation media, they'll increasingly differentiate. So we're going to study the process of changes in differentiation in dicer minus microRNA minus cells. So I think this makes an argument that microRNA regulation is not as critical in proliferative cells as it is in vivo because there's a lot of studies, hundreds of studies I could summarize that show that when you delete dicer in a developing animal, you don't get limbs, you don't get the immune system, you don't get other tissues that are critical in the animal. So clearly microRNA regulation, even to the tune of deleting a single microRNA, family is critical for the viability of the animal, but it's not critical for cell proliferation. And I think that suggests robustness. So now let's look at microRNA in stress. This is another form of microRNA regulation, and this is going to lead to a, a, a mechanistic insight. And it, it is, uh, uh, I think, something very interesting. It's new. It's not published. <laughs> None of this has been published since I started the last half. We're working on it. Uh, this is microRNA and stress, and as I said before, if you look at robustness, it's the issue of can microRNA stabilize cells to gene expression programs under different stress and non-stress conditions. Well, you look back in uh, publications in 2003, uh, it was shown that a microRNA knock knockout in Drosophila 
uh, increased sensitivity to soft stress. Uh, in uh, 2007, Eric Olson published a very important paper in Science in which microRNA 208 in mouse, uh, if you delete it, uh, you, you advocated a stress response in cardiac growth in mouse, and in microRNA uh, 8 in fish, and in microRNA 7, this is from another graduate student, an ex-graduate student from my lab working on Drosophila development, uh, here is microRNA7 in a very elaborate control mechanism in the eye of Drosophila controlling the photocell development. Uh, if you grow the animal under constant temperature, microRNA7 is not required. You get normal development, you allow the temperature to oscillate between 25 and 32 degrees, and the eye just falls apart. So it's under fluctuations that this microRNA becomes critical. Now we published in 2006, that stress in mammalian cells uh, uh, affects uh, translocation, in part, of microRNA containing organic complexes into something called the stress granule, which is a cytoplasmic structure that forms under stress, as Anderson at Harvard Medical School reported early on. And in these stress granules, what happens is that proteins that bind that are normally located in the nucleus that bind RNA also are translocated to the cytoplasm. They arrest translation by enlarge or reduce translation. And some of those are also, this is HUR and TIA1, uh, are concentrated in stress granules. This is part of the cell's response to stress and how it conserves and distinguishes between different messenger RNAs that should be preferentially translated under stress conditions. What we showed as well is that these RNAs or argonauts that are complexed in the stress granule exchange with the cytoplasm with a half-life of about 20 seconds. So it's a dynamic structure. It moves in and out. What's known to occur is that in stress granules, the messenger RNAs are arrested at the level of translation at forming a complex on the cap. They exchange into the broader cytoplasm where there's more extensive translation and this is a distribution uh, which uh, concentrates these uh, subset of these messages in distress granules. That process is concerned between plants and humans. Uh, it stalls initiation. A certain subset of proteins are also concentrated here, TIA1 and others, and it promotes degradation. Let me illustrate the formation of stress granules. This shows a HeLa cell in which there's GFP tagged argonaut 2. Uh, these uh, fluorescent dots here is where the Argonaut 2 is concentrated in P granules. Those are bodies in the cytoplasm that are sites for degradation of messenger RNA. And if at time minus six minutes, we use oxidative stress on this cell and photograph what happens, uh, you see the formation of these stress granules throughout the cytoplasm where Argonaut is being concentrated in stress granules that have these arrested complexes of translation, and about 5% of the argonaut uh, is concentrated in these stress granules. The rest is throughout the cytoplasm. 1% is in the P granule. So this is stress formation, dynamic, exchanges, 20 seconds. What could be the constituents involved in stress? Well, stress is found in cancer, epoxic conditions. Here's a section to a tumor. This is staining sex, uh, stress granules in the cytoplasm. And then this epoxic layer, there's stress granules. So it's a major regulatory process in cells. What's the process involved? How are microRNAs involved? What I'm going to tell you in the next five minutes, uh, which will end my lecture, is that we have evidence now that a whole a nuclear process that had not previously been identified as being involved in cytoplasmic regulation, that is the synthesis of poly-ADP ribose, or PAR, is the me me matrix, we believe, for stress granule formation and influences mRNA translation. Now, PAR is known in the nucleus of a cell to be a stress-responsive system. It's been known for a long time that DNA damage recruits PAR, it is activated, and in it ADP ribosis, this is a polymerase, ADP rib ribosylates, proteins on glutamine and uh, other amino acids, 
and can form highly branched, very long uh, poly ADP ribose chains or PAR. And this then is a platform on which DNA repair occurs in the nucleus of a cell. And it's a very important platform because if you pharmacologically inhibit it, it has a major effect on cell viability in certain cases. So PAR is known to be a stress responsive activity by modifying a protein with a very RNA-like substance, poly-ADP ribose. As I mentioned before, PAR is required for chromosome integrity, transcription and cell biology by uh, inhibitors. PAR1 is now a major target by pharmaceutical companies in BRCA1 minus cancers. BRCA1 is involved in homologous DNA repair. BRCA1 breast cancer and ovarian cancer is defective in homologous repair. PAR is involved in non-homologous in-joining. That's the other way chromosomes are healed in, in fragments in, in tissue. You inhibit PAR in a BACR1 minus, and you get a dramatic response in terms of uh, induction of cell death. However, the inhibitors that have been developed here have also been shown to have activity in, in ischemia models, inflammation, and degradative processes. We think it might be related to this cytoplasmic effect. So what's the evidence? I won't be able to show anything like all of it, but I just want to summarize it here. Here is cells that have been stressed by oxidative stress. You see here the stress granules. They are uh, stained with a specific antibody to EIF3, a translational factor that's concentrated here. So the polymer is concentrated in stress granules. The polymerases, five of them, all translocate to the stress granule under stress conditions. And the hydrolase, the, the activity that degrades the polymer, also is, is concentrated in stress granules. So it's dynamic, as we see in cells. We have the polymer there, the polymerase is there, and the hydrolase that de degrades it. And I won't show you the evidence, but if you inhibit the polymerases, it, its formation is inhibited. If you increase the hydrolases, it, uh, uh, the stress granule formation is dissolved more rapidly or blocked if you do it in another way. Is there any biochemical evidence that these poly-ADP riboses are involved? Here is non-stress stress conditions for Four different activities, all of which are known to be concentrated in stress granules, TIA1, an RNA binding protein, poly-A binding protein, a RAS interacting protein, which is really highly ribosylated, and uh, uh, GFP Argonaut 2, and all of them except the poly-A binding protein are increased in ribosylation under stress. And it's interesting that the poly-A binding protein is the only one of the four which, when overexpressed, will not nucleate stress granules. So we think this ribosylation is involved in formation of the stress granule. And so we picture this as stress granule formation being activation of ribosylation to RNA, protein, proteins bound to RNA, creating then a network of other proteins that bind to the poly polymer, bind to other proteins, and ultimately transiently make a stress granule. In this, messenger RNAs are exchanging out of uh, fairly rapidly into the cytoplasm. Now, does that affect translation? This is the last data slide, and I'll sum up in a moment. So I just want to summarize what we've learned to date. Uh, this is a reporter essay that we've used to look at translation. In this particular case, in this reporter assay, we put a very short half-life protein, luciferase, in the reporter. And we target uh, multiple sites through a microRNA type targeting. So we're getting microRNA regulation of this system we developed many years ago. So what you see under normal conditions is that relative to a control siRNA, this siRNA with that target reporter will decrease translation by 20-fold. If you target the polymerase 13, you even get an increase in repression, so it's more effective microRNA silencing. If you target the hydrolase, you get a decrease in repression, and that decrease is about sevenfold. If you go to stress conditions, what you see is the translation effect in the absence of microRNA targeting of this reporter decreases about fivefold, so under stress, 
the microRNA targeted message being preferentially translated relative to the control. <coughs> Target the polymerase that increases target of hydrolase, you almost completely desilence all the microRNA regulation. So what that shows us is preferentially in cells, we have microRNA targeted to messenger RNAs and you get translational inhibition relative to a non-targeted control. But under stress conditions, due to interactions we do not understand yet, relative to the control, these RNAs are preferentially regulated. So microRNA is giving us a robustness to this regulation based on uh, expression in stress conditions. We would hypothesize that these messages, in some cases, have uh, need to be expressed under stress condition for the cell to survive after stress passes. So I won't go through this, this just summarizes the evidence we have that this poly-ADP ribosylase system is involved in the formation of stress granules. We suspect it's involved in other types of subcellular location and that it's involved in microRNA regulation by giving some aspect of preferential regulation to microRNA uh, activities. So this leads me with the idea that microRNA regulation and I'm not the first to use this term robustness, it's been used in a couple of other papers before, is involved in the cell type stability and response of cells to stress and to terminally differentiated state or differentiated states. And it adds to cell regulation by regulating about half of all the messages and those messages are important for many regulatory processes and for, in some ways, responding to stress. So I thank you for the opportunities to present this talk. And I just basically want to acknowledge these individuals who contributed. Anthony Lung has really done uh, the ADP ribosylation work with Paul Chang, our colleague at MIT. And we've collaborated with Chris Burge and others, uh, and Paul Anderson at Harvard, who gave us uh, a lot of help uh, in the initial work on stress granules. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, let's open it up for uh, questions and uh, discussion. Uh, anyone else here want to lead off? Other than Joe? We have, um, well, first, uh, I would just uh, reiterate something you said. Stress is something cells experience extensively in their, their, their lives. Uh, glucose deprivation, oxygen stress, hydrostatic pressure stress, and other activities. Stress granules as a subcellular organelle is seen in those cases, as I illustrated in terms of uh, cancer hypoxic conditions. Uh, and I would anticipate that microRNAs in those conditions are also engaged in stress response. And I will point out that Eric Olson in his studies, in uh, cardiac studies, has shown uh, a defect in response to stress in uh, s animals that have been deleted for microRNA 208. There are studies showing that even microRNAs in the fibroblasts that are invading the heart are critical for the fibrosis of response to uh, hydrostatic stress. And those, when silenced, affect the response to stress. So there's lots of evidence, model systems, mouse systems, that stress uh, is an important part and microRNAs are involved in controlling the response. Now, whether it's this pathway, I don't know. No one's ever talked about ADP ribose being involved in stress. This is this is something that came out of a you know, peculiar situation, but uh, we looked at it. So uh, I don't know if, if this pathway is there. 
We will know soon, I'm sure, because pharmaceutical companies have major drug programs in these parts and will be able to, to distinguish uh, activities between the nuclear parts and the cytoplasmic parts. Is there a microphone over here? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Do you think you make the stress uh, stress mechanism that different? Uh, well, it's, we've only been able to study it in the context of cell culture, and there, yes. Uh, it has, uh, you know, and again, we haven't studied it in a cell-to-cell -cell variation pattern, uh, but we do see that, uh, you know, as you increase the time and increase the intensity of these stresses, you see more, more effects. So I, you know, that's the early answer to that question. Uh, we haven't been able to pursue it. I should mention, I did mention, that in all those cases where we have dicer minus cells, you stress those cells, they die. They're very sensitive to both oxidative stress and temperature stress. So the, the two stresses that we've used, uh, they're much less resilient than, than cells that have microRNAs. Yeah. Uh, this guy here wants a mic. <laughs> given your uh, unique perspective on RNA biology, the question I'd like to ask is, why was RNAi missed for so long by the molecular biologists? I mean, this seems like it's just everywhere. It's under our nose all the time. Um, what are the single or few reasons you think it's been unnoticed? There's two major answers to that. Okay, for the vast majority of the field, they felt that if you looked in this size range, 20 to 21 nucleotides, 20 or so, that all you would see is degradative products of the messages in the cell and the ribosomal RNAs and the tRNAs, and you wouldn't see anything. Even after Ambrose and Rutkin published a regulatory molecule, LIN4, of this size, and even after the AnySense field, realized that 21 nucleotides was enough sequence information to target one gene and silence it, no one looked. All right? So then there's another answer. You, you talk to the old cell biologist, Sheldon Pinman at MIT. He's a physicist turned cell biologist 20 years before uh, I got into the field. Yeah. There's a little lie that cell biologists won't tell you. I said, what is it, Sheldon? If you look down there at the bottom of the gel where all the small RNA should be, he said, there's thousands down there. <laughs> he said, some biologists don't want to get out there. <laughs> so I think there was a, uh, a concern that you know, there had been enough small RNAs characterized and they just shouldn't be looking down there. Reputable people didn't do things like that. Yeah, you're going to get tied up in all this stuff. And uh, I think the combination of the two, and then there wasn't a good graduate student <laughs> who walked into the lab and said, I don't care what you say. I'm going to clone out of 21 nucleotide RNAs and see what's there. Because if they had cloned out of those RNAs, they would have recognized they had unique links and unique sequences, and then everything else would have been a ball game. The question over there. Give this guy, give this guy a mic. His hand has been up since, since we began. <laughs> Uh, the microRNA siRNA pathway is found in uh, pombi, uh, a yeast, single cell yeast. It's found in other organisms. Uh, Tetrahymena has uh, extensive uh, microRNA utilization. You look in the plant uh, world, as I mentioned before, RNA, small RNAs, plays a much larger role. Same protein activities, same activities used different ways over in the plant. So clearly, microRNAs predated the divergence of plants and mammals back in this, you know, and then there's, it's present in sponges and being uh, documented by uh, David Bartel. The interesting thing, just, uh, you know, that people have, er, have studied the RNA world early forms of life. There's a second transition that's really quite interesting, and that's the generation of DNA. If the RNA genome was there, and it certainly was there, I'm totally convinced, 
Then the DNA genome came later. And in the DNA genome, you had to have in transcription and, and uh, many other processing. It's interesting that the key activity in this pathway is an RNAs H homologity Kiwi grain, and that the polymerase in plants and in worms that amplify this process is a homolog of Pol2 and the, and the DNA polymerases. So I wouldn't be surprised if this process was not involved in the early transitions between RNA and DNA as well. Oh, microRNA regulation of transcription looks like it's very similar to the regulation of transcription of protein encoding genes. There is uh, transient activation in P53 and NF-kappa-B and other systems. There is developmental specificity. The only one thing I would add to it is that I suspect that as we think of it this way, and there's some work that says this, that as uh, each cell type in the body has a combination of transcription factors that probably control that cell state. And in many cases, there are cell type specific transcription factors that are driving the, the differentiation process. Uh, my guess is that in most of those cell states, those cell factors drive the transcription of a set set of microRNAs that drive this, the, the cell into this more differentiated condition. So there's a coupling between the transcriptional cell state and the microRNA-driven cell state. And uh, I believe that's going to be a productive way to look at all of this. But it's very clear from the work of Yanaka that the master control in mammalian cell states is transcription. Because you can take transcription factors, express them in cells, and jump them from somatic cells to embryonic cells from B cells to somatic cells, you know, you, the other somatic cell types. Transcription dominates, microRNA follows, microRNA is, uh, is very important. Okay, let me throw in a question. I'm interested in the role of I'm not a vascular biologist. Okay. You are a vascular biologist. So let me answer the question in a very general way. What I am saying is that under stress conditions, and I assume hydrostatic stress would be one of those, which would be signaled into the cell environment, that those messenger RNAs in which microRNA are complex are likely to be preferentially translated relative to the total body of messenger RNAs, and that subset of proteins is likely to be important for recovery from stress. Okay. Are other questions out there? Okay, well, I need to make a presentation to our distinguished lecturer. I also should say that any of you that want to come up and talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, please, please come up at the end of the uh, lecture. But uh, Bill, uh, we wanted you to have something to take back um, to MIT. And by the way, you don't have to take it through security. We'll mail it to you, Thank you. If, you want, if you want. But uh, thanks for just a wonderful lecture.